The only thing worse than a preacher talking politics is a preacher who doesn't talk politics. Now, there are people within and beyond the church who are certain that religion and politics should not be mixed. And you can understand why they think that way. The two in combination don't have a very pleasant history. Religious extremism seems to breed political instability and not just overseas. I, for one, get a little twitchy when politicians and religious leaders appear on the same platforms and use the same unctuous language. Let's talk about family values, they say. And I reach for the volume control. When that happens, it is a sign to me, at least, that both groups are afraid of something. And you can bet that what they're afraid of has nothing to do with broad, compassionate, sensible leadership. Yes, faithful people can and do have political ambitions. That's not a bad thing. It's okay. I know some perfectly wonderful, faithful people who have devoted their lives to politics and to the credit of everybody on, on, on either side. And faithful people cast ballots. That's okay too. You should. Please vote. But you should also be informed and able to consider your choices from the perspective of your faith. My faith influences my approach and my engagement to political things. That's okay. It's, it's necessary. It's, it's mandatory. But politics and religion shouldn't be the same. If my political ambition is to install a religious system in the city or the province or the, or the nation, and I announce that as my political platform, then people of every stripe should stand up and complain loudly. And if my religious ambition is to dominate the political landscape, and tell my flock how they should vote and what, you, what they should think and where they should go with their money and their ideas. If my religious ambition is to require people to think and worship and believe like me, people should complain even louder. They should resist that sort of nonsense. Politics and religion should not be the same. They're distinct. They're two parts of a broad way of viewing the world. Jesus, plenty of people have told me, is not a political figure. That's right. But his faith puts him in opposition to the ideas that surround him, political and religious and otherwise. And in the social climate of his day, his faithfulness put him in opposition to political people and religious people, and especially to the religious folk who have hitched their wagon to the predominant political voices in the region. There's all kinds of good reasons to do that. You want to be able to practice your religion? You cozy up to the powers that be so they don't destroy your temples. These things happen. 
They happen in our own time. The only thing worse than a politician with no religious conviction is a politician who's a religious zealot. See, it cuts both ways. Nobody is immune. Nobody can stand apart. To be silent is, in many ways, to give consent. Jesus is never silent about these things. In fact, Jesus proves himself utterly fearless in his contempt for those who would blur the lines between politics and religion. Nowhere more clearly than in our reading this morning from Luke 13. Now, I know there are some of you who are thinking, now, wait a minute, wait a minute, Jesus talked about this. He did, I remember, he did. All the time. But specifically, in three of the four Gospels, around the question of paying the tax. You remember that? Who wants to pay the tax at the temple in a coin with Caesar's image on it? And there's a debate You remember, you remember. And you remember what Jesus said. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and render unto God what is God's. And people think, oh, well, that's settled. Separation, church and state. No, no, that's not what he meant. This is not just about paying the temple tax. This is not just about keeping your political ideas in a different pocket than your religious ideas. This is entirely about your worldview. To whom does our loyalty belong? That's the question Jesus wants you to ask yourself. Scripture tells us that the the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Full stop. And yet the law of the land tells us how we ought to act and behave within the boundaries of a particular country. And both the scripture and the law of the land have authority over us. Especially those of us who believe. So, where do you draw the line? I think in Luke 13, Jesus helps us decide. He lives in in occupied territory. And so is subject to Roman, Roman law by virtue of the armed presence in the land. But he's also bound by Jewish law by virtue of the covenant that he was born into. And so his faith helps him, as it does many others, helps him endure the Roman occupation as a temporary thing in the grand and eternal nature of God's care and concern. But the situation in occupied Palestine is, to use the best word of the day, complicated. Concessions have been made by religious leaders and political leaders. An unnatural truce seems to have been arranged. There's nothing wrong with that. Wanting to survive in a hostile political environment requires awkward concessions sometimes. We know that this awkward arrangement is in place because some of the Pharisees, the religious leaders, come to Jesus with a concern. You'd better get out of town, sir. Herod is looking to have you killed. He wants you dead. And Jesus treats this advice with with contempt. You tell that fox that I'm going to do what I do, and I'm here until I'm done. That seems all well and good. You've been warned, Jesus. Fair enough. But then 
he offers a speech that seems a little puzzling at first. He mourns the state of affairs in Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I have longed to comfort you and you refuse. Jerusalem is at the heart of religious life in Israel. It is the capital city in every sense. It is where the Romans have their their biggest garrisons. It is where the temple is on the highest point. It is the center of everything. The political and the religious worlds collide here. And Jesus' sadness at the state of this beloved city suggests that the lines have been blurred beyond recognition. Your house is left desolate to you, he says. And in some translations, they make the suggestion that Jesus is talking about an abandonment of the temple a collapse of religious authority. Because that's what happens when religion covets political power. We have our own experiences with the careless intersection of religion and politics. We don't have to go as far back as the early first century We can think about the mid-20th century. And those of us who are students of history will remember what happened in the church in Germany and other places to those who stood up against the despot and to those who went along to go along. That didn't end with the destruction of the Third Reich. We continue to endure the suggestion from one group or another that our nation needs to get back to God. How many of you have heard that statement in the last 24 months? Yeah. Does it frighten you? Because it should. It should. There's always a subtext with that, always. Our nation needs to get back to God. Well, we have also heard politicians shamelessly court people of faith with vague promises about safety and security and freedom and whatnot. And frankly, the easiest thing in the world would be to ignore it all and wait for Christ to return. But since Christ seems to be dragging his feet a little bit. We have to choose another option. We must be prepared to carefully consider those options from a perspective of faithful followers of Jesus, who is always our guide. When you hear language like this, When you hear promises like this, when you hear politicians and religious leaders jumping up and down on the same trampoline, ask yourself, what kind of world do I long for? What kind of world? Is it a world where people of integrity must hide to avoid the Herods of the day? Is it a world where diversity of opinion and belief are discouraged out of fear? Is it a place where righteous anger too often turns toward deadly violence? Because this is the world that Jesus knew, and it's quickly turning into the world that we are all too familiar with, Jesus stood against the cruelty of oppressive politics. And Jesus marched into the heart of religious exceptionalism 
and gently and fearlessly proved those approaches to be powerless. I am going to do my work, he says. Today, tomorrow, and the next day, on the third day, it'll be complete. And I'll finish it in Jerusalem. Come and get me. And to all appearances, to the outward appearances, Jesus' project, Jesus' approach is an utter failure. He arrives, they sing his praises, they wave branches. And then he's arrested in the night. He is tried in secret. He is condemned and executed in a most horrible and public fashion. So much for fearlessness and integrity. But three days later, when the work was complete, the true nature of Jesus' mission was revealed. The worst that the unholy alliance of church and state, a perpetually broken system, the worst, the worst punishment they had to offer was no match for the redeeming, renewing power of God. Jesus was fearless in his accusations of those who coveted power for power's sake. And we can be fearless too. We can be fearless because of God's desire to redeem and repair what we have misappropriated and left for lost. And that includes religious systems. And it includes political systems and family systems and social systems. Anything that we have claimed for Caesar, God can gently and patiently redeem And he has done so. Be sure of it. But we're still with Jesus. Who is determined to finish what he started. Determined to go to Jerusalem to endure the worst that the political system and the religious institution have to offer. Thanks be to God, we will discover that God always has something better in mind. That something is so good, so delightful, so new, so fresh, so liberating that it must affect the way we engage with the systems and institutions of this world. The only thing worse than a preacher who tells you what to think is a preacher who will let you think for yourselves. Let it be so. Amen.